Welcome to the second Sunday of Advent. It's a time where we get an opportunity to look forward with expectation to what Christmas is all about, the coming of our Savior. And so we get an opportunity to just look in this season for something new, something that we've never experienced before. Because as Pastor mentioned earlier, this is a Christmas like we've never had before. And though it's a Christmas like we've never had before, it doesn't mean that the wonder of this season changes because this season is so great. Last week, we started this idea of looking into Advent and looking at this Advent wreath that uh, we brought out and we lit the first candle last week and so I'll light it for us this morning. I will tell you that last year they gave me this and I almost burned something. So um, let's pray that don't happen this year. And we lit this first candle of hope to remind us that there is hope even in a season when it seems like things are hopeless the coming of our savior gives us hope and this week we want to light the second candle this candle on this side will represent peace peace that our savior was coming to bring us and it was peace that is different than any peace than we know we talk about peace and it's a peace that looks a little bit different than maybe what we conceive of. This peace that Jesus was going to bring, this peace that our Savior was going to bring us is a peace that is greater than our understanding, Scripture teaches us. It's a peace that is all-surpassing regardless of what our circumstances is. Are. It's this peace that would be described as a shalom peace. I read somewhere that when they were describing shalom peace, it means as if a slice of heaven were residing in your life. And that's the type of peace that Jesus came to offer. And so this second week as we journey into Advent, would you remember the peace that Jesus came to give? Because it's that peace that is going to see us through whatever it is that we face in this Christmas season. This Christmas season, like we mentioned already and have mentioned probably since the beginning of this uh, fall and winter season, was that this season is going to be different. It's a time when we don't even know what to expect next because we don't know what is coming next. Whether it's a vaccine, whether recently here in California, hearing that we may be closed down again in even a more stricter fashion, We don't know what is coming next, but we do have an opportunity to expect something new in this season. See, I think a lot of times what happens with with Christmas time is we always look at Christmas time with expectation. But this year, that expectation is different. Traditionally speaking, we would look at Christmas and we would be excited to give gifts, send Christmas cards, decorate, light candles. And do all of the Christmas traditions that we are typically used to. And yet in this season, we don't know if that's going to be something that is going to be part of our Christmas tradition. We oftentimes look at Christmas and we get excited as Christians because we get to retell the story of our dear Savior's birth. And yet, here it is, that season. And all the excitement that we should have somehow seems dampened, and yet the story of Christ, the story of our Savior's birth has not changed. And so that excitement and that wonder should still be in our hearts, and yet we pause because we don't know what's coming next. And I think we get excited because we read this story that we'll read in just a second. It's found in Luke chapter 2. And in Luke chapter 2, the story starts like this. It says, At the time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. 
And that night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. And suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger, and suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth. To, them, to those to whom God is pleased. See, we get excited about that story because as we think about that story, it reminds us again of the Savior, but here's what I have come to learn about really great and amazing stories. Really great and amazing stories will stand up on their own, and this story in and of itself stands up on its own. It's a great and wonderful story. But any great story has an amazing backstory. And when we look at this story, we have to recognize that there is so much more that comes before this story takes place. There is so much that happens prior to this story. When we look at this story in its actual context and look at this story in the context that it was actually given, when it actually happened, that it took place with real people, and it took place in a time when people were trying to find a way. They were waiting for something. The story takes on so much more meaning. And not only does it take on so much more meaning, but I believe there is so much more appreciation that comes to that story when we understand and recognize that there's so much more backstory to be understood and grasped to see the wonder of this first Christmas. At the beginning of this year, my family and I decided that we were going to start watching movies from beginning to end. We were going to find as many series as we could and we were going to try to watch them from beginning to end and we were started with the Star Wars story. Recognizing that, I'm going to probably offend some people here by saying this, but recognizing that the original Star Wars movies, episode 4, 5, and 6, are probably the best of the set, but yet those stories and those movies stood up on their own as great stories, but there was so much more to the stories because we come in into episode 4, 5, and 6 of Star Wars in the middle of the story. So much had happened, so much character development, so many things took place prior in order to make this story so great. And so we watched the first three episodes of Star Wars, and I tell you what, they were good, but they're long. And there's a lot of storytelling and not a lot of action. And most of us like to get into the story where there's more action. And yet, in these first couple of stories, in these first couple of episodes of Star Wars, they're kind of slow. But we watched them. And as we watched them, and then we got to the third and fourth and fifth and sixth episodes, not only did those stories make more sense, but we gained more appreciation of how good those stories were. And when we take that principle, when we understand that that principle is also true about the story of Christ, we recognize that that story is incredible on its own, but we also need to understand the context in which that story came from. See, again, that story comes in context of some very real people, and let me share with you just briefly what that story looks like. See, at the very beginning of time, it says that God created Humanity, he created them in his image and he created them to be like him and to take on his very image in the world that he created. But something happened in that, in that time. God created them to have relationship and be together with him. And something entered into the scene, sin that would cause separation between God and his perfect creation. And when that happened, God said, I have to do something. Something has to be done because he was just. But yet he didn't just say, I'm, not, I'm going to do something. He said, I'm going to ensure that there is a way that the relationship that I longed to have with this creation would be restored. And so he set in motion this plan 
to restore and redeem humanity back to himself. And he chose this family that he said, this is the family through whom I'm going to bless the nations, but I'm also going to ensure that the relationship that I want with my creation to be restored, it's going to flow through this family. And so generations would come and go where they were waiting for this renewed and restored relationship. And eventually the family would grow And there's more to the story, but they would end up in Egypt. And they would live there because of things that took place. History was happening. And as they stayed in that place, eventually it says that there would be a pharaoh, a king that would rise up that would know nothing of that people's story. And that pharaoh would enslave the people. And they would cry out for years and years and years looking for Redemption, looking for the relationship back with the God that had called them out in the first place. And they waited. And the pharaohs came and they went and eventually this man, Moses, would come and he would be God's representative to bring them out of slavery in order to start a new nation through whom God would choose to bless all nations around and Moses would lead them out. And they would walk to this land that was promised to them generations before, part of the promise of the restored relationship. And yet, as they journey into this land, it says that eventually there would become this group of people that would grow up that would know nothing about the Lord, and they would turn their ways, they would turn away from Him and turn their backs on Him. And the people then would be enslaved again, and generations would come and go, and eventually that nation would start to get its feet steady and they would ask for a king because they didn't want the Lord as their king. They wanted someone new as a king and they then start with one king who fails and then they get another king and then there's constant kings that rise and fall that are not always following after God's heart. And this people that say that all they wanted was relationship They watch and they wait as generations come on the scene and they pass waiting and waiting and waiting for the promises that God had spoke many generations prior that there was going to be one that was going to come. And all they had was promises. All they had was a word that had been spoken promising them that one day one would rise up. Promising them that one day someone would come to not only make things right, but that would restore relationship with God forevermore. But all they had was a promise. And they waited, and they waited, and they waited. And all they had, again, were stories that would be told. And one of those stories of the one that was to come is found in Isaiah chapter 11. It says this, the branch from Jesse. He says, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. And from his roots, a branch will bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The spirit of counsel and of might. The spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness he will judge the needy. And with justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips. He will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt. And faithfulness, the sash around his waist. And generations would pass, holding on to that promise that that one that was to come was going to come with all of those attributes. They didn't know who it was that was going to come, just knowing what he was going to be like. And some remained faithful. And others lost hope and turned away as they continued to wait because the Savior that was to come, the one that was promised, had yet to come. And so they waited. And more stories would be told. Like this one in Micah chapter 5, it says, But you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. And therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who was in labor bears a son and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. 
He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be our peace. And again, nothing. They waited, and time would pass, and more prophets would come on the scene and tell additional things about this one was to come, that was to come, but yet they still waited in darkness even. And the final prophet would rise, and it would be 400 years from the time that that prophet would rise up telling stories of this one that was to come and the time that the Savior would be born. And time would march on. History would happen. Empires would rise. Empires would fall. Nations would rise up and nations would fall down. All still waiting for something. And yet, it's in that very context, it's in that very darkness, it's in that very silence that these people waited, these men and women waited for their Savior to appear on the scene and they expected this one that was going to come full of righteousness, full of peace, one that was going to be a shepherd over his flock and they waited and they waited and they waited and nothing. And time would pass. And eventually, when the time had finally come, there would be one that would come. Paul says it like this in Galatians chapter 4. He says, but when the right time came, at the perfect time, thinking that God had forgotten all about them, but God was doing something because it was at the perfect time. It says that God sent His Son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent Him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that He could adopt us as His very own children. See, God was still working. As we were waiting, as those people were waiting, God was doing something. He was setting up in the proper time, at the right time, at the perfect time to send Jesus on the scene. Because so many things had to take place. Everything had to be perfect for this Savior to make it. And it says, Paul would say, that it was at the perfect time. That when the people thought all they had was silence and all they were going to continue to do was wait, and they probably even continued to lose hope as the years would pass and no Savior would come. And as I think about this story and as I think about that perfect time and that first Christmas, that miraculous time when Christ would be born and the angels would sing from heaven, what it must have been like in that moment to be waiting and yet not receive everything that they had been waiting for. And yet, on that first Christmas, on that miraculous morning, on that miraculous day that Jesus was born, what they got was not what they expected. They didn't get this king. They got a baby. They got what they wanted, yet not what they expected. Rather, they got what they needed, not what they wanted or expected. And this baby came. And with him came all of these great things which we'll continue to unpack in these weeks to come. But if, if we can look at this story and find ourselves in this story in this Christmas season. I believe that this Christmas season that we are in is not very different from the context of that very first Christmas in that we, in this season, are waiting. Some of us are waiting for a miracle. Some of us are waiting for a job. Some of us are waiting for healing. Some of us are waiting for for something and as we sang this moment this morning all we did was say we are here God waiting here for you with our with our hearts with our hands lifted high and i have to believe that those very people in the very when that very first christmas took place that they some of them were in that same posture just waiting saying god we are here waiting for you we will not give hope Though it has been silent, we will not give up hope on you. Because we know that when you come, when you send the one that is to come, you are going to offer us peace. 
You are going to offer us hope and something new. And so we are going to wait in expectation. And so they waited for that first Christmas to come. And you and I in this season are not very different. See, we are here just waiting. Some of us are just waiting for God to show up. And can I just encourage you today that God will show up in His perfect timing. He will show up. And it may not look like the way we want or expect, but it will be perfect. All He asks us to do is to wait with expectation, with hearts open to Him, recognizing that though we may not see it right in front of us, He is working. He is doing something. He is working behind the scenes. He is setting up something for your good and for His glory. And the question isn't, is He doing something? The question is, what are we doing while we're waiting? Nicky Gumbo, a pastor in England, said this, that he believed that what is more important is not what happens at the end of our waiting, but what happens to us while we wait. And Rich Viotis, he's a pastor out in uh, Queens, New York, he had this to say about the Advent season. He said, the good news about Advent is not that we are faithful in our waiting because we often aren't, but that God is always faithful. I added that always in there. But God is faithful in His coming. See, the one thing that we can hold on to, the one thing that we can put our hope in in this Christmas season is that God has not forgotten us. That what we've gone through in this year and what we're going through even in this present season, God has not and will not forget us. That behind the scenes, He is doing something good and He is doing something amazing. And what He's looking for us, I believe, in this season to do is to posture ourselves much like those at that first Christmas did, but posture themselves saying we will remain faithful. We will remain hopeful. We will open up our hearts, God, to what it is that you are doing, and we will continue to work to bring people to know who you are and to help them find their freedom and to discover who you have created them to be. We will continue to do those things while we wait for you to show up. And this Advent season, again, does not have to be any different than that first Advent. Their hearts were postured in the right way, and so I ask and I encourage you in this Christmas season to posture your heart, to posture your mind, to posture yourself, your worship, in a way that says, God, I will not waver in the waiting, but I will continue to do your work because I know that you will continue to do your work. And so in this season, I ask you this. What is it that you are waiting for? What is it that you are looking for God to do? And what is it that you are holding on to hope for? Because if you will continue to wait with your hands lifted high in praise to the one that is to come, I believe that he will bring you and grant you peace like you've never experienced. Peace in the midst of chaos. He will bring you a heart full of joy. And so how you wait is important because if you will wait with that posture and that attitude, I believe that this Christmas season, though it might look different than we've seen it and we've said that 400,000 times already, it could be one greater than ever before. It could be one that draws us instead of from a place of trying to get and, and, and accumulate, it could cause us to come to a place of recognizing the true heart and meaning behind this season of expectation. And it's a time where I believe that God will draw us back closer to Him and will speak to us in ways that we've never spoken before, we've never heard before. See, here's something that I believe. I was having a conversation with somebody several months ago when they were talking about 
this idea of well, this pandemic and all of these things that are going on, it means that it's the end of days. Can I encourage you that when Jesus came the very first time, he started the end of days. And though we may be getting closer to that time, this pandemic is not the only thing that draws us closer to Jesus. There's all kinds of things going on in the world. This is the one that we see right now. But yet, in the midst of all of those things, I believe that Jesus, just as he did at that first Christmas, offers us hope and offers us peace and offers us something while we wait that is greater than anybody or anything could ever offer us in this season. So in this season, will you continue to wait with expectation? Will you continue to reflect with expectation that God is going to be faithful even when we lack faith? And will you continue to wait knowing that God is up to something and what he is up to is good? As we pray this morning, we have teams that are, are ready to pray with you on our online campus. They would love to pray with you. They would love to spend time talking with you. But see, here's the thing about this Christmas season that I also recognize is that maybe you've, you're hearing this story for the first time or maybe you're hearing it again for the first time and you didn't recognize that this story came in the context of some very real people that were waiting for something. And maybe you've, you've given up hope and you've stopped waiting. This Christmas season, can I invite you back into that relationship that Jesus offered that we celebrated because of his death and resurrection is, that is available to you. And all you have to do is just simply say, Lord, I receive you into my heart in this season. Even right now, I receive you into my heart. And it's just that simple to be able to start fresh and start new with God and there are people again that would love to pray with you and I will pray with you in just a moment but I want you to know that there is so much good to still be seen in this season and like Pastor Scott mentioned last week don't let this be a season that we just go through emotions the motions but let it be a season in which we truly discover and rediscover the wonder of our Savior's birth and whatever it is that you're waiting for, would you wait for it with an expectant heart drawing you closer to your God and your Savior? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for sending Jesus that first Christmas, that first Advent. Thank you for sending him. And thank you for sending him in a way that we would never expect but in the perfect way and in the perfect time for sending Him. And thank You, Lord, that that first Christmas season points to all of the Christmases that, are, that were to come after that, that they were to be seasons of expectation, of renewed hope, of renewed offers of peace from heaven towards us. And it's a reminder to us that, God, You have not given up on us. And so, Lord, I pray that in this season, if there's any of us that have forgotten the wonder of your birth, that have forgotten who you are, maybe did not even know who you were, that even right now that we would receive you in our hearts and that we would look at the rest of this Christmas season differently with expectant hearts, with hearts postured towards you as you draw us closer to you. Lord, would you bring miracles like only you could bring? Would you bring healing like only you could bring? God, would you provide in ways that we never thought possible? Will you do things in this season like we've never seen before? Because we know that you are up to something and that you are still working even if we can't see it. You are working in your perfect timing. Help us, God, as we wait to remain faithful and to look into the rest of this season with hearts full of joy, full of hope, and full of peace. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.